From awaytogarden.com and robinhoodradio.com, this is A Way to Garden with Margaret Roach, your weekly invitation to dig in and grow. It will come as no surprise to regular listeners that I'm mad about small, farm-based companies that sell seed grown without chemicals and with a regional focus, seed matched to a particular set of conditions for best results. Today's guest is the founder of one such company, High Desert Seed in Colorado. And even though I don't garden in the high desert, I confess I'm very tempted by the unique offerings like toothache plant and a gorgeous eggplant from India, all with wonderful stories behind them. More in a moment, but first, these messages. Programming and underwriting support from Brushwood Nursery. For more than 20 years, Brushwood Nursery has shipped the finest selection of clematis and other vines all over the United States with full gallon sized plant and free shipping. Their website is full of beautiful pictures and information on growing clematis. BrushwoodNursery.com. Programming and underwriting support from Garden Tool Company. Garden Tool Company's wide selection of heirloom quality, quality tools for your gardening passion is backed by outstanding customer service, fast shipping, and ongoing support. GardenToolCompany.com. Before Laura Parker founded High Desert Seed, she had many other seed adventures, including working in India with activist and seed saver Vandana Shiva, and later back in the U.S. becoming executive director of the Organic Seed Growers and Trade Association. She's here today to talk about the importance of regionally adapted seed and showcase some goodies she's working on, and also drop some names of other companies whose catalogs we ought to be browsing. Hi, Laura. How are you? Hi. I'm well. Thank you for having me, and thanks to everyone listening. Yeah. So I have to say I love that quote on your homepage, the Mexican proverb. It says, they tried to bury us. They didn't know we were seeds. <laughs> yes. Yes. So it's such a beautiful image and, and, and so powerful. Seeds are so powerful. So how long ago did you found High Desert Seed and where are you located? Just give us a little quick sort of position context. Yeah. So we, I founded High Desert Seed in 2015. And we are in the Uncompahgre Valley um, in Colorado on the western slope at the base of the San Juan Mountains. And I grow on my farm at about a little over 6,000 feet in elevation. Mm -hmm. And it's family land, is that correct? Did I remember that correctly? Yep, it's a a family operation. I I Mm -hmm. lease for my family and live with them, and they're amazing support to me. So you also say on the website, highdesertseed.com, that you specialize in seed that is regionally resilient, and then, quote, seed with a sense of place. And I love that. And so tell us why regional matters when we're talking about choosing seed and using seed. And and obviously, I should say the disclaimer, I'm in the Northeast, but there's a couple things I want to order from you. And over the years, I've grown things from like Southern Exposure Seed Exchange and all kinds of crazy places around the world, actually. But more as fun and extra goodies, not as my main crops, which I try to pick regionally adapted seeds. So, yeah. Well, every every bioregion has unique a unique quirk and quirks and seed is unique and it, it can adapt to whatever region it's taken to. Um, and for instance, you know, in my region, we are known for really intense sun, big temperature swings. You know, we have a 20, 20 degree on average difference from day to night and, you know, very short season, um, as well as different soil and winds and, and that kind of thing, um, as well as, you know, increasingly drought conditions. Yeah, so it's, you know, seed that really is in a place for a long period of time and selected to thrive under those conditions is going to be more robust. And it's really what we've had um, traditionally, you know, until about World War II. Um, When we started in with hybrids and really seeds started to be you know, farmers were not saving their own seed stock as much, and and we've kind of lost that art of saving our seed in our regions. So for generations, farmers had saved the bean and the 
the corn and the this and the that. And it was because seeds alive and adaptive, like any other organism, to its conditions over generations. It adapted to those local conditions, like the ones you're talking about, which are very distinct. And it might not, that seed might not like growing up if I planted it in my garden, which is rain, much, much, much rainier and lower elevation and much more humid in the summer and so on and so forth. It's going to be a bit of a shock <laughs> to its system. Yes. Yes, it can be. And, and that's actually kind of what inspired me, you know, watching my, my mother growing up who had come from West Virginia try to adapt to growing a garden at 7,000 feet on our ranch and really struggling and, and kind of, that was my first insight that there are, you know, varieties that are just so much more robust in, in these conditions, um, in the high altitude environment. And, you know, I never thought I'd be able to grow a watermelon where I do. And I, you know, have found watermelons that, that thrive here. Ah. Now, do you find the addresses on your customer orders extend beyond Colorado and the wider sort of high desert, like the Intermountain region and and elsewhere? Do you find people from other places are ordering, discovering you and ordering your seed as well? Yeah, I do. Um, But it's been really beautiful to see, you know, a majority of our customers are in the Intermountain West. Um, But yeah, we're sending seeds all over the place. Um, And certainly, you know, we're kind of a marginal growing region, so things selected for our environment are likely to really thrive in longer seasons, more gentle climates as well. So they're super resilient. They're 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 like the size XL, you know, the XR X extra resilient. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I think so. (laughs) Um, So. So they're all open pollinated. You grow them, if not in a certified organic. And, and by the way, I think it's true that you grow some there and you have like a small network of like-minded um, people, a farm farmers, seed farmers in your area who grow some of them. And so it's a little bit of a collective of where it comes from, but it's all local. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to build more of a seed network. I think it's really important for diversified farmers to get in to growing seed again. Right. So let's talk about some of the, and I, like I said, I already have my list of what I want, <laughs> but let's talk about some of the things. I mean, you, the, some of these smaller, that's so exciting for me over the last, especially the last 10 years to meet so many more of these newer or smaller um, regionally focused seed companies with farm-based growing and so forth, and that are following organic practices, if not again, if not certified, literally, um, because a lot of times you guys are just adopting these varieties that otherwise would be lost. Like nobody would care, particularly because they're not the big money-making hybrids, right? Right. That's that's really. So important, you know. I think in our community, we're very excited about having more and more regional seed companies because we believe in really maintaining that biodiversity. And you know, for me, I really feel like it's important going into climate change that we have, you know, all the tools in the toolbox that we can possibly have as we're looking at a crazy erratic environment. Yeah. So what do you, I mean, I know what I want to ask you about that eggplant from India. That's some beautiful thing. I don't even know how to describe it. Um, But, you know, you have so many things that I've never seen before. Yeah, the the Navdanya eggplant is, um, it's an Asian variety that I received when I was at Navdanya working with Vandana Shiva. Yes. And so it has that green mottled skin and it's, I mean, by, you know, happenstance, I brought it to Colorado and it's just wonderfully early and productive variety. And it has the sweetest, creamiest um, flesh when it's, when it's cooked. Um, so that's interesting that it would be an early, it sets early, considering it's from India, which I would think of as a longer season, yeah? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure quite where it originated from, but it's, 
it's an, it was an amazing find. Cool. And, um, and yeah. I asked about the tooth. I mentioned the toothache plant because it's Spilanthes, I think, of the genus is. But um, what the heck is that? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the toothache plant is, um, it's a really, it's kind of got like little gumdrop flowers that are kind of like almost bullseyes. There's different um, circles within it. And they're a medicinal herb as well. And when you pop one in your mouth, it has this kind of numbing effect. Um, and it's really potent as like for, for gum health and, um, and also as an adaptogen, but, um, it's a really cute little ornamental plant as well. How, how big is the plant? It's, it's an annual, is it? Is it an annual? Yeah. It's about a foot around, um, okay. when it's full grown. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So what other things are you exciting? I mean, I could just go on and on, but <laughs> I want you to tell us what you're excited about or working with um, that you're featuring. One of the most exciting um, varieties for me right now is the Paiute Gold Teperi Bean. And Teperi Beans are actually their own genus and, and species. They're not like a, a common bean. And, and they have this incredible... Like, they're probably the world's most drought-tolerant, salt-tolerant, and heat-tolerant plant, or bean plant. Oh. Um, yeah, and they, they've they been known to, with the with one big summer torrential rain pour, to grow, set seed, flower, and set seed all from that one rain. rain. Um, and it's from, the variety that we have is the Paiute Gold Teperi, and it's really you know, is a gift from the, the Paiute people who grew it along the Colorado River through Utah and Nevada and also the Tohono O'odham people. Um, and basically my experience growing it, it's, you know, one season I was kind of babying it along and I'm like, oh, it's not blooming. It's not doing anything. You know, it looked all healthy and everything. Um, but it was only until I took away the water that it actually went to seed. And it's oh, tough love, it's just, tough love. <laughs> yeah. Well, it needs it to, it's really developed for just growing with the summer rains and using very, very little water and has a, apparently a, an amazing network of, of root system underneath it. So it's, anyways, it's just an amazing variety that has so much potential as we're, you know, in Colorado facing much more frequent droughts. Um, looks like a drought coming up this next season, but this variety is also really delicious and kind of a nutty and hearty bean that kind of holds its structure when it's cooked. So we we grow it for and then we dry it and we use it as a dry bean. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, you have an, a couple of aurochs and. That's not something that I know a lot about, although I do see them in recent years in various catalogs. You have a red and green one that's so gorgeous, I almost just want to grow it for its gorgeousness. <laughs> yeah, it's it's quite a looker. It's it's beautiful kind of magenta with a sheen of green. And it's it's what I call we, some of us call it mountain spinach. Yes. Because it's it's quite kind of like the texture of spinach and you can cook it just like spinach um but it's tolerant of of heat so here when we go you know from really cold to to the heat kind of overnight it seems like in the in the summer um it's really hard to grow spinach through the season so it's actually a really wonderful alternative for that um it's also three times as high in vitamin c as spinach is it has oh. really wonderful nutritive properties Oh, and do do you is it or is there a part of the season that it works well in that orc works well in or is it um, like is it I, I don't know how long it is to harvest how long it takes and so forth. Yeah, so you can kind of start it in probably even in early or late spring. Whenever really, I mean, you can mm -hmm. you can start it any time of the season, um, okay. and then once you get it going, you can kind of just keep pulling leaves off of it for a good probably month or two. Okay. Really. And then it's going to start to bolt and go to seed. Um, it's actually one of those plants that you kind of want to watch. If you let it go to seed, you're going to have it forever in your garden. 
which might be a oh, good thing. <laughs> yes. I have some of those, Laura. How did you know? <laughs> oh. Um, calendula is like that for me here in the Northeast. I don't know about for you, calendula is like that. Um, not in a horrible way. Perilla, the shiso plant, um, you know, a kind yeah. of Asian herb is definitely like that in a big way. Dill, of course. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, oh, I just you... started working with perilla. It's such a beautiful one. Yes. So you have a quinoa. It's a that you're working on too. I've never grown quinoa, but tell us about that. Yeah, so quinoa is kind of my obsession. <laughs> it's um, it's kind of my first breeding project that I undertook. And early on, before I started High Desert Seed, I got as many varieties of quinoa as I could possibly find at the time and threw them all together and have been really selecting this variety for our conditions over time. And Quinoa is just such a fun plant to grow. You can you can grow it just for the leaves and eat the greens, and they do kind of have a like they're have a almost spinachy taste, but then a, you do taste the quinoa flavor a little bit in, coming through the greens. Oh. Um, and then it grows these kind of tall plants that have a a panicle of where the seeds are blooming, and the the coolest thing happens in the fall is it. You know, it's kind of a maybe a boring green plant at first, but when it the fall comes, the whole plant infloresces and turns neon colors, even in the seed head and everything. Um, it's just such a fun plant to grow. Um, and really, we've seen it adapt so quickly. It's such a plastic, like in the biological term, uh, plant. Uh-huh. It just has quickly transformed, you know, the first time I grew it, the, my plants were barely a foot tall and now they're taller than I am. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. That's, that is plastic. And we don't mean plastic plants, people, fake plants to bring in and decorate your tabletop, with. <laughs> but plastic <laughs> as in genetically elastic sort of. Yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. Exactly. <clears throat> yeah. Cool. Um, and what about that pepper whose name I can't even pronounce, but it almost sounds like it's um, from India or something. So I'm not going to, I'm going to butcher the name if I try to say it. Seren- so the, the Serenyevi pepper, which I'm probably butchering the pronunciation as well. <laughs> um, Maybe we should spell it for people listening. It's S-I-R-E-N-Y-V-I. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Um, and it's, a beautiful purple pepper, which that was a big qualm of mine of of not being able to find a purple pepper that really produced peppers in my area. And this, the Sirenieve is amazing. It it fits the bill. And it's also this kind of triangular shaped sweet pepper that has these beautiful striations on it. So it's deep, dark purple with kind of light lavender striations. Oh, And then it turns to a deep, kind of purpley red as it as it to- fo- fully matures and gets even sweeter. Oh. But it's probably one of the earliest to, to really set on a really produce a large quantity of peppers. And it's just one of my most recent finds of peppers, and I love peppers. And um, I'm just super excited about that variety. It sounds beautiful, too. I mean, besides delicious. Yes. <laughs> yeah, beauty beauty, and also taste are really critical to me. I, I just, if it doesn't taste good, you know, why, why grow it? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And speaking of purple, that purple barley, I don't, again, it's not something I've ever grown barley, but you have a purple barley, so the seed is purple. Is that the idea? Yeah. Yeah, it's... um. The Dolma is the variety that I've found, and I really, you know, I being connected with the regional seed companies, I was first introduced to birth, purple barley from adaptive seeds, and ever yes. since then, I've been kind of obsessed with it and just on a mission to try as many purple barleys as I could, and I finally was gifted this variety, and it just totally blew all my others away. It, it, um, it apparently originates from Tibet. 
and had been being stewarded by a company called Thumbs in Idaho. And it's got these purple grains, and it, it grows beautiful plants and doesn't lodge. Tell and us you what can lodge actually means. produce in like a 10 by 10 foot space, you know, about 5 to 10 pounds of barley grain. So tell us what lodge means, you farmer, you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. So it, it's referring, lodging is when the plant falls over into the, to the dirt and, and uh, makes the grain, you know, unusable or yes. unharvestable. Yes. Yeah. And it doesn't do, it's resistant to that behavior. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I want to spend our last, you know, four, four, three, four, five minutes, something like that. You know a lot of other farmers, um, like-minded farmers, regional seed farmers, and from your various work and I just, and from conferences and who knows what. Tell us some other ones that you're, you have an eye on at the moment that you're excited about. Yeah, so um, I'm actually going to focus on ones in my own region. Uh huh. And yeah, and one of the companies I'm most excited about are my friends over at Grand Prismatic Seed Company. They're over in Utah, just over the border from from me, and they're um, they're so awesome. They're specializing in a lot of dye plants, and as well as an amazing array of wildflower seeds. Um, huh. In addition to to some more um, traditional garden garden seeds, um, another wonderful company is Snake River Seed in Idaho, and they're actually a cooperative of growers and um, have an amazing collection there. And they've also and they're just really um, you know a model for me also to to try to bring more farmers, diversified farmers that aren't necessarily growing seed, but into seed growing, which I think is is so critical. Um, Another company is Wild Mountain Seeds, and they do a lot of high altitude breeding. Um, They really specialize in uh, very unique tomato varieties. Yeah. And they're growing at like, I think, 8,000 feet. And in addition to them, there's also another high altitude company called High Higher Ground Gardens, and they're over in Crestone, Colorado. That's one I don't know. Another really interesting one is um, Lineage Seeds, and they are really creating kind of like an heirloom to take through the generations. They they sell all their seed in these um, ceramic seed pots. Lineage seeds. Okay. That's, again, another one new mm-hmm. to me. Grand Prismatic and the dye plants has caught my eye a number of times, and I knew about I knew about them. And, um, yeah. Uh, I want to ask you before we finish up, I, I, and I wanted to say to people, we talked about some oddballs from your catalog um, from High Desert. But, you know, you have this great selection of marigolds and lettuces and, I mean, mainstays of, of things that – are, are wonderful as well. And as you point out, you have customers in various places and you're a really tough place. And if, if it grows there, it may do well in, in, in more gentle <laughs> spots as well. <laughs> um, but marigolds and what are their flowers? A couple of other flowers that you love like that? Yeah. Um, let's see. What is my most favorite flower at the moment? I love the, the paper moon flower is a, probably cause I love seeds, but it, it is a scabiosa or a pincushion flower, so it sends up oh. kind of light blue little pincushion flowers, but then it very quickly forms a seed head, and it makes the most dramatic. They're just like little whistle balls. Um, but it's right. <laughs> um, just, you know, a long-lasting flower you can have <laughs> in your house forever, the seed head. Yeah. Oh, a good one. Yes, yes. And, and a good description, yeah. actually, too, wiffle ball. So Laura Parker <laughs> of HighDesertSeed.com in Colorado. Um, I, I wanted to thank you for making time. I know you're swamped because this is the busiest time of year, and it's an exceptionally busy year ahead for seed companies everywhere. So I wish you the best, and thank you for making the time. I hope we'll talk again. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate okay. this opportunity.
Programming and underwriting support from Garden Tool Company. Garden Tool Company's wide selection of heirloom quality, quality tools for your gardening passion is backed by outstanding customer service, fast shipping, and ongoing support. GardenToolCompany.com. Programming and underwriting support from Brushwood Nursery. For more than 20 years, Brushwood Nursery has shipped the finest selection of clematis and other vines all over the United States with full gallon-sized plant and free shipping. Their website is full of beautiful pictures and information on growing clematis. BrushwoodNursery.com. And thanks to all of you for listening in, too. Now, don't miss an episode. You can subscribe free to the podcast version on Stitcher or iTunes or Spotify. And you can find me anytime at awaytogarden.com or on Facebook, and on Instagram as at Away to Garden. Happy gardening meantime. Away to Garden with Margaret Roach is a joint production of awaytogarden.com and the smallest NPR station in the nation, Robin Hood Radio.